This is a roll call. A roll call to all of the brothers and sisters of the village community. It's time to come into our own power. It's time to wake up. Wake up that spirit that is within us. Wake up, everybody. To the village community, I issue a new definition of being black. Black means possessing the ability to overcome. Black means derived from the people of Africa, Mother Africa. Black is beautiful. A slogan created during the 1960s civil rights movement. Most importantly, I come to you not as a Republican or a Democrat, not as a Protestant or Catholic, but I come to you as a black man, God's divine, magnificent creation that he placed upon this earth that we may rise, rise and be a powerful people. We are all tied in the single garment of destiny and we hold these truths to be self-evident. I am convinced, I am convinced that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Hate cannot drive out hate. What we need, brothers and sisters, is a new love, a new, strong, agape love. In retrospect, being black in America, we've had to endure and overcome some catastrophic events. We've had to overcome the voyage of the Middle Passage, the seasoning of the slave, the inhuman violations aboard the mothership, the auction blocks and other unspeakable atrocities. But up from that past, that's rooted in pain, came a black woman, Sarah Boone, who invented the ironing board, Lord P. Ray, the dustpan, George T. Simon, a black man who invented the clothes dryer. T.A. Carrington invented the stove. Lydia O. Newman, the hairbrush, and William Purvis, the fountain pen. We are all tied in the single garment of destiny, and we hold these truths to be self-evident. I am convinced, I am convinced that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Hate cannot drive out hate. What we need, brothers and sisters, is a new love, a new strong agape love we've had to endure systematic segregation the trojan horse conspiracy the montgomery bus boycott the freedom riders bloody sunday confrontation at the edmund pettis bridge but up from that past that's rooted in pain came a black man Hello and welcome to Shaping Young Minds. My name is Michael Brown and today we're going to have the Black History, Black Future Awards. And today our presenter is Dr. Mark A. Sinsdak and he's going to present the first, he's going to present the Barack Obama Award for Leadership. To tell you a little bit about Dr. Mark A. Sinsdak, he has a BS in Physics from the California Institute of Technology and a PhD in Physics from the University of Wisconsin and his career covers the computer industry, defense industry, the defense industry in the U.S. space, and also in education, and currently he's executive director of Chicago Defender Incorporated and of the Bud Billigan Parade. Now here he is, Dr. Mark A. Sinsdak, a presenter for the Barack Obama for Leadership. Hello, everyone. The Honorable Barack Obama is the 44th President of the United States of America. He was born in Honolulu, Hawaii. He attended Occidental College in Los Angeles, California, Columbia College in New York, and Harvard University in Massachusetts. Eventually, Mr. Obama made his way to Chicago, where he worked with churches to help communities rebuild that were devastated by the closing of steel mills. Most notably, Mr. Obama eventually became Illinois State Senator and then eventually United States Senator and, of course, President of the United States of America. He has a number of achievements prior to his presidency. He was the first African-American president 
of the Harvard Law Review. He also taught constitutional law at the University of Chicago. During his candidacy for president, this country, this world, was facing the real possibility of an African American becoming president of this great nation, the most powerful position in the world. That candidacy, unfortunately, allowed the ugly head of racism to rear itself for everyone to see. Nevertheless, Mr. Obama won. Once he became president, he faced a rare crisis. And in this crisis, this country was facing the worst economic condition since the Great Depression. This country was at war in Iraq and Afghanistan. This world was facing environmental peril. And once he became president, Mr. Obama, by many accounts, simply because he was African American, he was facing tremendous op opposition within Washington and across the country. Nevertheless, this man, this president, brought the economy of this country around. He rescued the automobile industry. He reformed health care. His signature mark, Obamacare, is still in effect today and defended by many who seem to oppose the implementation of the plan in the first place. This country under Obama experienced the longest growth of jobs in the history of this nation. This man, Mr. Obama, demonstrated class, elegance, intellect, and power facing some of the most tremendous opposition that any president has ever faced. He is an inspiration to all African Americans that you can achieve the most powerful position in the world and everything else in between. On behalf of Shaping Young Minds, we thus present the Leadership Award to the Honorable Barack Obama, the 44th President of the United States of America. Accepting on behalf of Mr. Obama is freedom. Congratulations. Yes, I am delighted to accept this leadership award and I appreciate everyone's support through the whole experience as being a president. Thank you. Our next presenter for the Shirley Chisholm Award for Politics is Ms. Ari Pinnock Esquire. Ms. Pinnock is a native Chicagoan. She grew up in Inglewood. She graduated from the University of Chicago with a BA and an MA in Administration of Criminal Justice Law degree John from the John Marshall Law School. She ran Fair Housing Organization, which was founded in 1966 by Dr. King. She recently retired as Executive Director of the Field Foundation. Here's Miss Ari Pinnock, Esquire, to present the Shirley Chisholm Award for Politics. It is my honor to be able to present this award um, in recognition of Shirley Chisholm, one of my sheroes, um, as a young African American girl growing up in the city of Chicago. Um, Shirley Chisholm was a daughter of immigrants, but born and raised in Brooklyn, and always seemed to find a way to achieve, even though back then it was doubtful that African Americans, and particularly young girls, were going to be academically driven. Surely proved them wrong. She got a scholarship to Oberlin and Vassar, but could not afford to attend, and stayed home and went to Brooklyn College, and where she got a BA. 
But that wasn't enough for her. Being the uh, inspired person that she was, even though she was working full time as a teacher's aide, she managed to go to evening classes, take evening classes at Columbia University, the same Columbia University that President Obama attended uh, as a student in 1981. Um, once she got her master's in early childhood education, she began to look at things from a different lens and structurally wanted to know if she could make changes. She believed that educating young people was a way to do that. But she also saw that the political forces around her were hampering her. So inspired by her own will, uh, willfulness and, and intent, in 1964 she became the only woman in the New York Assembly, a State Assembly. And later in 1968, the same, day, same time when I was graduating high school, she became the first black woman to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. She remained in that state, in that office for 14 years, and in 1972, being unbought and unbossed, she became the first African American and the first woman to put her hat in the ring for nomination for president of any major party. Uh, her, her nomination took a great deal of uh, uh, stress, if you will, to the Democratic Party that had often talked about its progress for African Americans and women, and Shirley Chisholm tested them on that. And for her willingness to step out and in front, she inspired people like the Reverend Jesse Jackson to run two campaigns who she strongly endorsed. And the legacy, her legacy for politics has been acknowledged by President Obama as well as Hillary Clinton in terms of being able to step apart from a democratic system that supposedly represents us all, but when challenged to leadership, sometimes seems to back off. I am truly honored to be able to give this uh, award to my hero, Shirley Chisholm, with Shaping Young Minds. I know that in her quest for education and working with young people, this is exactly what she would want. Uh, and I'm also truly honored to be able to say that um, the person accepting this honor and recognition of Shirley Chisholm is China. I would like to accept this politics award with the utmost desire to leave my legacy upon modern youth. As the first black woman to, woman to be elected for United States Congress, I've made others realize something very important. Representation matters. Coming from two immigrated parents who worked tirelessly to make ends meet, I decided to do the same. I took education serious. I made a legacy and you can too. There may be an era in history where we may find ourselves hopeless. Where we, where we may notice that the people who are supposed to serve and protect are not doing so. We will notice that the government is being run by the very people who can ruin this country. But learning the rights that have been bestowed upon you and taking advantage of every bit of knowledge is a behavior that will cause revolution. Thank you for the Politics Award. Uh, I have to stand corrected on something uh, for Miss Ari Pinnock Esquire. She attended the University of Illinois, Chicago. Just wanted for that correction. Thank you. So while I'm here, uh, our next award goes for the Martin Luther King Award for Civil Rights. Also, our pre presenter is Miss Pinnock once again. Miss Ari Pinnock, please welcome. Again, I am humbly honored to be able to present the Martin Luther King Jr. Award. I was blessed this past summer to be able to visit Atlanta again and remember the intense uh, impact he had on that, that city, that state, this country, uh, the world. Um, Martin Luther King, I mean, it, it, we could go on and on and on and, and, and talk about his impact on, on the lives of not just African Americans, but people throughout the, the country and the world. From Montgomery, from the Montgomery boycott uh, spun by the, the brave, the, the heroic works of uh, Rosa Parks to the march to Selma, uh, from the, the people's, the Poor People's March in, in, in D.C., the I Have a Dream speech, 
quite frankly, to his coming to Chicago in 1966 and, and speaking in Soldier's Field. Uh, as a young person, I was honored to hear him speak not uh, on TV as, as the one in Soldier's Field in Ogden Park in Inglewood, where he talked to young people about things about hope and understanding that you too can achieve if you believe, and believing in oneself is essential to, to making change. And, and for the young people here today, I want that to be part of his message, that he believed in the, 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 the attitude and, the, and, the, and the, the commitment of the young to be able to, to challenge some of what we're, we're facing now and, and he faced then. The Soldier's Field piece was the beginning of the uh, roots of uh, the work in Chicago, but quite frankly what really sealed it was the Marquette Park March when Dr. King uh, marched in Marquette Park and uh, was faced with uh, what he called the most uh, intense racism he had ever experienced. And coming from a man in the South, that, that says a lot about what Mar Marquette Park brought to bear. Um, but from that became the creation of the nation's first fair housing organization, the Leadership Council for Metropolitan Open Communities, uh, which was established in 1966. And I was honored to run that organization as a civil rights attorney from, 2000, from 1992 to 2004. Um, the untimely assassination of, of Dr. King in 1968 uh, is, is in Memphis, Tennessee. Is, is one thing that most of us who were alive then still are challenged with, and there'll be a 50th anniversary for that uh, in the coming year. But it's a challenge of what, what he left us to, to bring forward and what he left, he would admit, that he left undone. As part of the, the, the Big Six and the Civil Rights Movement, there were charters of progress that were to be made. A lot of that was done under his tenure and, and, and with him at the helm. There's still much left to be done uh, uh, in his honor and, and from, from where we are uh, today. Um, I, uh, again, am honored to be able to, to present this award to the young people who Dr. King had hoped to and I'm sure did inspire. The young man accepting this award uh, in Dr. King's honor is Gabriel. Like to, <clears throat> I would like to thank Young Minds Shaping Organization. I would also like to thank Martin Luther King for his unpatient dream for equality to become a reality. I want to give an excerpt from the Birmingham jail letter. When you go for a cross-country drive and you find it necessary to sleep in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile, when your first name becomes nigger and your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your mother and father, I'm sorry, mother and sister are never given the respected title misses. This is why we can't wait. Again, I would like to thank Shaping Young Minds Organization for this award. Thank you. All righty, thank you very much. Now for the Jesse Jackson Award for a community activist. The presenter is Mr. Dennis Gatherwright. Mr. Gatherwright is an English teacher at Creek Moni Educational Center. His passion is writing. He's the writer of three books and he's also a poet and also a public speaker, a teacher and youth pastor at the Apostolic Assembly on the south side of Chicago. To present this award is Mr. Dennis Gatherwright. We'd like to um, <clears throat> thank uh, Shaping uh, the Young Minds for this uh, opportunity to present on behalf of Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson uh, Sr., Jesse Lewis Jackson Sr., is a disciple of the Dr. Martin Luther King um, legacy. And one of the things that we can definitely stand proudly to say is that he uh, continues to serve the community. He uh, started the, um, he was favored by Dr. King to start Operation Breadbasket. 
Operation Breadbasket uh, emerged into what is uh, today known as the Rainbow Push Coalition. And in honor of the service um, award or the community service award that is being presented today, we can definitely say that he is constantly and still, he's been working, Jesse Lewis Jackson has been working uh, consistently over 50 years. And that's one thing to take note of. He has been consistently working in the community for over 50 years. He uh, ran for president in 1984 and 1988. And from that um, emerged the Rainbow Push Coalition uh, in conjunction to the uh, Operation Breadbasket. So it emerged into the Rainbow Push Coalition. And today we can say that he is still serving the community because he is giving the organization has handed out over a million dollars worth of scholarships yearly. Also, they are uh, continuing to feed and service the community. They, are, uh, they have successfully, this even this month, giving out 250 uh, baskets to the community. Uh, they have a um, college tour, a black college tour that they do uh, to the black historical colleges yearly. So on behalf of this service community, uh, keeping the hope alive and also helping us to realize that we are somebody, we would like to present to someone that we feel comfortable will continue this, uh, the service of our community, the upbuilding of our community uh, in recognition of Jesse Jackson. We'd like to bestow this community service award upon Gabriella Gatherite. I would like to thank Shaping Young Minds Organization for this prestigious award on the behalf of Reverend Jesse Jackson, Sr. I want to thank him for his 50 years of continuous service to the community and helping us millennials be able to believe that we are somebody. Thank you again for this award. Oh, applause. Hello and welcome back to our program of Shaping Young Minds. I'm your host, Michael Brown, and we're doing Black History, Black Future, Black History Future. And our next recipient for the Dr. Francis Chris Wilson Award for Self-Awareness is Brother Randolph Dolph Norris. His profession, he's a retired DD metaphysician. His passion is empowering Moorish people, especially the youth, and his title is the president of the Ceron Corporation. So now he is Dr. Randolph Dolph Norris. Uh, greetings, everyone. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Actually, Francis, Dr. Francis Wilson is my shero, second only to my mother. And I do mean that, second only to me. See a picture of her here, gives you an idea. She just passed in uh, January of this year. Uh, Dr. Francis Wilson, she was a Afrocentric psychologist. She graduated from Antioch College in 1957 and got her MB or MD from the University of Howard in 1962. She from Chicago, was born and raised in Chicago. She, after she got her uh, doctor's degree, she moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, she's also the child of a physician, a mother of a teacher, so she was very well educated. Dr. Cress Wilson, it's a lot to say about her, but I just got a few minutes, so I want to hit it right on the head. She's an author of the book most of you may know of, ISIS. She has yet to be known uh, globally. She's the one that identified racism as a global system that affects us all, from the birth canal to the grave. She also has a lot of controversies when she stated that homosexuality among the African American was a ploy by white males to decrease the black population. 
Welsing was born in Chicago in March 18, 1935. Her father, as I stated, was a physician. Her mother, Ida, was a teacher and what she earned. Her views, the ISIS paper, it describes white people as the genetically defective descendants of albino mutants. She wrote that due to this uh, defective mutation, they have been, may have been forcibly removed from the continent of Africa. She describes racism as a global system, and she also attributed AIDS, addiction to crack cocaine, and other substances to chemical and biological warfare against the African American people and other people of colors. It's a lot more to say about her. However, she described white uh, supremacy as a white, as an ideology based on the belief that white people are superior in many ways to other races of people, and therefore white people should be dominant over other races of people. She went later on to prove that. White supremacy also can be referred to as a political or social economic system where white people enjoy a structural advantage over others, ethnic groups, and both uh, collectively and individually. Now she described the global system that we're currently under. What happened when the Europeans left and out of Europe, they went all over the globe and everywhere they went, they found people of color, and they found that they themselves were the minority of the planet. So they went out to show themselves in, uh, superior when actually they were deferior, because we know about the rat uh, experiment, a black rat, white rat, you get a black rat, so a, a darker rat. But she went to describe it. She said white supremacy, being that global system, the head of it is economics, education, and entertainment. The body is labor, law, and politics. The legs is religion, sex, and war. She also went on to say the feet was technology, food, and nutrition. All these systems are being, is one system being used against us. Now to end, in the long run, Dr. Francis Welsing's work will be remembered as the key to unlocking the door to put the Europeans in their proper place as a minority group on the planet. The Asian culture currently is the first to use the key to dismantle this global racist system through economics, education, and entertainment. It is my pleasure and honor to speak of her, and you will learn more about her. And I'd like to have Mrs. China to accept the award on the behalf of Mrs. Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. I would like to thank Shaping Young Minds for the Self-Awareness Award. The first step in tackling any obstacle is being self-aware. Even if you have a maze, if you have a map to get out of a maze, you cannot get out of the maze without knowing where you stand. Knowing how you contribute on a global scale is the first step in dismantling such a global scale like racism. Thank you for the Self-Awareness Award. Thank you. Okay, our next award is the Sir, Sir Joyner Truth Award for Women's Rights, and our presenter is Ms. Monique Adams. In education, she's in education and social work. She works at Chicago Public Schools and is a outreach coordinator for Metropolitan Family Services, and she's a commu for community activist. She belongs to the Gately Park Advisory Council and is a member of WESEE, which is an acronym for Women Empowerment, Civic, and Engagement. Last but not least, she has an organization, New Araya Foundation, Awareness Rebuilding All Household. So, Ms. Monique Adams is a presenter for the Sojourner Truth Award. I am honored to be here to present um, for Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth stood for many things. Um, she was a very admirable woman, and she did many admirable things. Truth was born into slavery at 11 years old, and she was, uh, she was born into slavery and sold for $100 along with a flock of sheep. In um, 1826, 
she fled her master uh, one year before the abolition of slavery. Sojourner Truth talked about her experience um, that she had with abuse um, as she continued to have whoopings and beatings all through her slavery. Um, after going to court to recover her son in 1828, she became the first black woman to win such a case. She was successful against many odds. Um, inspired by religion, uh, she changed her name to Isabella Bumphrey, at, known as Bella. As she became a traveling preacher, Sojourner Truth joined the Northampton Association of Education. Truth published her memoirs in 1850. Uh, back um, in 1850, she was an early rights uh, advocate for women, where she spoke very forcefully on. Truth joined forces with Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison in Boston, Massachusetts in the 1850s where she sang a song, I'm Pleading for My People. In 1851, uh, Truth delivered the best known, her best known speech as the Women's Rights Convention. The speech became widely known and very popular in the Civil War. It was titled, Ain't I a Woman? During the Civil War, an outbreak troop recruited for the Union Army troops after the war troop unsuccessfully secured land for the government. Truth later met with President Lincoln where he gave her the permission to become a counselor in the, uh, at Freeman's Village. Truth was employed by the National Freedom Relief Association in Washington, D.C., where she worked diligently to improve conditions for African Americans. Truth spoke about ab abolition, women's rights, prison reform, and preached to the Michigan legislature against capital punishment. Not everyone welcomed Truth and her preaching and her lectures, but she had many friends and influential people at the time. <clears throat> Several days before Truth died, a reporter came from the Grand Rapids Eagle to interview her. Her face was drawn and emaci emaciated as she was apparently suffering. Truth died at her Battle Creek home, November 26, 1883. I am happy to present this award to Monique Holmes for women's empowerment. Hello, my name is Monique Holmes, and I'm here to um, accept the award on behalf of Sojourner Truth, and I have a poem that I want to read from Sojourner Truth. It is her famous Ain't I a Woman poem, which she presented at the 1851 Women's Convention in Akron, Ohio. Um, it starts off saying, well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think between the Negroes of the South and the women of the North and all that talking about rights, the white men will be in a fix pretty soon. But, all that's, but what's all that here talking about? That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages, lifted over ditches, and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helped me into a carriage or over mud puddles or gives me the, the best any place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could ever head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it, and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have born 13 children and seen most of them sold off into slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none heard me but Jesus. And ain't I a woman? Then they talk about things in the head. What is this they call it? Um, intellect? What's that got to do with women's rights or Negroes' rights? If my cup won't hold but a pint 
and you don't want and you don't hold the court, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my my have my little half measure full? Then that little man back there in the black, he says women can have as much rights as men, cause Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. If the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down alone, these women together ought to be able to turn them back around and get it right upside again. And now they is asking to do it, and the men better let them. Obliged to you for hearing me, and now old Sojourner has nothing more to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You're still watching Shaping Your Minds. I'm Michael Brown, and this is the Black History, Black Future Awards. And thank you. But last but not least, as has been said, my hero again. But to tell you about my hero, Frederick Douglass born into a life of bondage. Frederick Douglass secretly taught himself to read and write. It was a crime punishable by death, but it resulted in one of the most eloquent indictments of slavery ever recorded. His gripping narrative talks, takes us into the fields, cabins, and main, ma ma manors of pre-Civil War plantations in the South and reveals the daily terrors he suffered as a slave. Frederick Douglass, born 1818, probably died in 1895, was the son of an African-American woman and a white slaveholder. While still a young man, he fled hungry and haunted to the North where he was befriended by the abolitionists. His dramatic autobiography was published in 1845, creating a sensation and spurring Douglass's career as a militant, uncompromising leader of African Americans. He recruited Ameri African American volunteers for the Civil War and later secured and protected the rights of the free men. Douglas became secretary of the Santo Domingo Commission, recorder of deeds in the District of Columbia and United States Minister to Haiti. In the introduction of his book, a narrative, when the lions write history, race is the continuing and moral dilemma of America and the inheritance of slavery is an er erratical moral stain. The further we are removed from the circumstances of legal slavery and legal and social racial and segregation, and the more eager we are to move beyond that inheritance and on other issues. The more persistent that awful legacy becomes, the problem of race in America is not simply a dilemma. As sociologist Ghana Maidro styled in Greek, even of biblical proportions, where indeed the sins of our fathers are visited upon the children until, until the third and fourth generation and beyond. It is increasingly fashionable to co-sign our tragedies to sepia-colored documentaries and to see them as part of the pageant of the growth of a great nation. One of the ways in which we protect ourselves protect ourselves, disturbing ideas is to label the medium in which those ideas are communicated as classic. This provokes a certain reverence and appro an appropriate historical or literary period in which we have power to disturb us. Douglas did not know the date of his own birth. In ignorance, he regarded as one of the worst legacies of his bondage, but he assumed that he'd been born in 1817. Perhaps in February to a white man, perhaps his master, and a slave woman, which he hardly knew, and who died before he was seven years old. Such anonymity were not the expectation, but to rule and slave societies in America. So individual identity was meant to survive in a system where slaves were regarded as real estate. His mother, he tells us in his narrative, gave him the synonymous name of Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. Dropping the two middle names, he was generally known as Frederick Bailey. During the course of his escape to, north, to the North, he became first Frederick Stanley and then Frederick Johnson in the name of abolitionists and benefactors in New Bedford, Massachusetts. 
There were, however, so many Johnsons in that city of refuge that he was obliged to change his name again. The benefactor Johnson was in the midst of reading Sir Walter Scott's novel, The Lady of the Lake, in response to young Frederick's need of a new name, gave him the Scottish surname by which he was forever known as Frederick Douglass. Thus, in the autumn of 1838, Frederick Douglass began his new life as a free man in the old whaling city, city of New England, Massachusetts. As a child, writes W.E.B. Du Bois of Douglass, he experienced neglect, cruelty, indulgence, and hard work, but particularly the tyranny and circumstances of an ambitious human being who was legally classified as real estate. Ambition, sensitivity, and a high degree of self-consciousness created in the young slave Douglas an unquenchable thirst for freedom, and he became what every slave master feared, a smart and uppity Negro who would be content with nothing less than his, nothing less than his freedom. At his first attempt at escape, it in failure in his time in jail. The second attempt, however, was successful. He fled to New York City, where he married a free Negro woman with whom he moved to New Bedford. He was to date his freedom from September 3rd, 1838. So now the presenter of this Treasure Douglas Award for Freedom, again, is Ms. Chardonnay Smith. I am so happy to be receiving the um, Freedom Award, and I am thankful for everyone's support. I hope that everyone continues to take opportunities to help a bigger cause. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have. We've been watching Shaping Young Minds. My name is Michael Brown, and we look forward to you again next time on Shaping Young Minds. And you've been watching Shaping Young Minds, Black History Awards, Black Future. Awards. I'm Michael Brown again. Have a great evening, and we'll see you again next time on Shaping Young Minds. Bye-bye.